Welcome to God and Country Biblical Exposition. The topic for this week's program is a continuation of last week's YouTube Amariism versus Frenchism or Pluralism versus the Law of God. And to get us thinking about this topic, on Sunday, uh, June 30th, New York City held their World Pride Parade. The supporters claim that between three or four million people showed up in attendance, uh, but that's really an exaggeration for marketing purposes. There are about 70,000 participants in the parade and then spectators along the streets, maybe about 400,000. Uh, pride parades are being held in many cities, but there's this organization called Interpride, which organizes major pride parades in select cities to create an occasion to bring together lesbians, um, gays, bisexuals, transgenders from all around the world. And they call it World Pride. Uh, they have held events in Rome and in Jerusalem and Madrid and London, and now they have held one in New York. It looks like the leaders of this enterprise organization have found a way to cash in on the movement. But nevertheless, the pride parades in America bring up this whole question of what is freedom. Does American freedom and human rights mean LGBTQ parades? Now you say, well, people can do whatever they want, but that's not really the issue here. The issue is, should they do whatever they want? And what are the God-given responsibilities to government in regard to regulating the morals of a country? Is freedom absolute or should freedom be limited? Uh, the ideological basis behind the sexual revolution in America is that no law of God is to be submitted to in a country. Everyone can do that which is right in his own eyes. Judges 21. And this is the new definition of freedom, and it's the wrong definition of freedom. Not only from an ethical point of view, but the American founding fathers believed that freedom was to be subservient to the law of God. So freedom was never to be absolute. Uh, James Wilson, one of the founding fathers of the United States, wrote, Without liberty, law loses its nature and its name and becomes oppression. Without law, liberty also loses its nature and its name and becomes licentiousness. The founders always believed in thy liberty under law. And in the wisdom of God in the New Testament, the uh, Bible addresses this possibility that liberty can be wrongly defined as a license to do evil, which the ungodly are doing in our generation. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 for you are called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So freedom can be misinterpreted to mean freedom to indulge in the sinful flesh. The freedom or the liberty we have in Christ is not freedom to sin, but freedom to do right and to not be forced to do evil. And also in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, we read, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Uh, this doesn't mean that we're free from God or free from God's law, but we're free from sin and free from the additional laws that were given in the Mosaic Covenant. And both individual and political freedom does not mean that a citizenship is no longer bound to keep the law of God or be required by the God-ordained magistrates to keep the basic law of God. Psalm chapter 9, verse 17 still holds true. The wicked will be returned to hell and all nations that forget God. So the great error in our day is this belief that freedom means you can do whatever you want to do as long as you don't hurt anyone. And the pride parades are all about people celebrating sexual liberation sexual freedom, which was never the intent of freedom described in the political covenant we made in 1789 in the forming of our nation. 
the dictionary definition of freedom may mean, quote, the capacity to exercise your will without interference or restraint uh, as the genuine expression of who you are or the absence of coercion. Well, if that's the definition, we need to instead talk in terms of limited freedom, righteous freedom, or freedom under law because absolute freedom becomes lawlessness and it's demonic. And unless Americans begin to define liberty as under the law of God, liberty or freedom will become our greatest threat and be the cause of America's downfall. The very founding principle of America, liberty, will be our end. Uh, Lincoln said in his Gettysburg Address, our nation was conceived in liberty. But someday, we may be murdered by the very idea we were conceived in. How ironic. Kind of, kind of makes you wonder if the crack in our liberty bell was a sign from God. Now, is this new threat of liberty because Americans have redefined liberty? Is it because Americans have put liberty above law? Or is it because from the very beginning, the word liberty or freedom uh, was the wrong word to use as a nation's guiding ethic? Because no matter how much you try to limit or define freedom, when people hear the word freedom, they hear, I can do whatever I want to do. And that has always been a problem with this word liberty. Uh, when people fight for liberty, as in the French Revolution, all sorts of lawless people get excited about the prospects of being out from under God's ordained government and the enforcement of God's law. Uh, yet God never intended for people to be out from under the authority of government. There will never be full liberty in that regard as long as we're in this world because men are sinners and governments are called of God to restrain and to punish sin. So wise men have always understood that this fight for liberty is not a fight for unlimited liberty, but a fight against unjust tyranny, against unjust laws. A true fight for liberty would be a fight for freedom from governments that permit the murder of infants, uh, that permit perverted sexual behavior. True liberty would be righteous laws and righteous judges. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of today's program, this is a follow-up on YouTube I did two weeks ago entitled Frenchism versus Amariism. Uh, the conservative Sarab Amari wrote an editorial against the conservative David French and his leanings toward libertarianism. Uh, the contention was that conservatives like David French, who appeal to personal autonomy to win the culture, are making a huge mistake. When they say, we will let the pagans do what the pagans want to do, if they will let the Christians do what the Christians want to do, that's a great error. Uh, for these conservatives, uh, liberty and, and Americanism means pluralism. Everyone does what they want to do. And then everything will be well. You know, th this sounds like the best state of affairs that given the government the power to regulate morals uh, would be a bad thing because government can then take that power and become tyrannical. But God actually does call the government to regulate basic morality. So the controversy comes down to this. Should those on the right, the religious right or otherwise, fight for liberty or be fighting for the law of God? Well, given today's meaning of the word freedom or liberty, biblically we need to be fighting for natural law, the law of nature, nature's God. Uh, liberty as an underlying ethical mandate will only fuel more leftist autonomy and lawlessness. Now, in the light of this debate between French and Amari, it just so happens that Oz Guinness has come out with a new book entitled The Last Call for Liberty, um, How America's Genius of Freedom Has Become Its Greatest Threat. Uh, 
in a varsity press. Uh, this whole subject of liberty is being readdressed by many pundits because it's being attacked and redefined by the left. Hence, you have thought leaders like Oz Guinness feeling compelled to write a book on the subject. Oz Guinness is one of those Christian philosophers like Ravi Zacharias or C.S. Lewis or G.K. Chesterton. Actually, I was somewhat disappointed in Guinness's book because he pontificated on and on, and he never focused on the very simple principle that freedom is to be limited. And government is called of God to enforce the law of nature and nature's God. It all could have been said in just one paragraph. You know, I will give him credit. At the end of the book, he makes a case for God. He writes, with the philosophy of the death of God and the postmodernist dismissal of truth, there will be no true freedom. He writes, all freedom requires restraint. But still, he never comes out with a clear, simple explanation that the role of government is not to give absolute freedom, but to enforce the natural laws of God. Now, John Calvin, in his treatise on civil government, written over 500 years ago, in 25 pages, said more about truth and about the way things ought to be than Os Guinness said in 300 pages because Calvin exposited the simple mandates found in the Word of God. Now, in the remainder of this program, I want to address a few points that Os Guinness makes in his book just for FYI, for your information, so that you can be a more informed, uh, discerning Christian. Uh, this is sort of a book review. I can't cover the whole book, but I can address a few points that I think will be helpful. So point number one, he begins by making the distinction between classical liberalism and what is called modern liberalism or leftism. And I want to point this out because we're hearing this a lot today. Many conservatives are now claiming that they are classic liberals. They're trying to make this, this distinction between liberalism as it started and liberalism today. Liberalism used to mean human rights, civil liberties, uh, economic liberty, small government. These were the ideals of John Locke and Adam Smith and Montesquieu, uh, the thinkers that influenced our republic. But now liberalism has become social liberalism, which is statism which is a disdain for tradition and religion and natural law. And it's a whole different breed than original liberalism. One wonders whether it should even be called liberalism. And this new liberalism emerged in the 19th and 20th century. Um, and liberalism, religious and political, then became a dirty word to those with a Christian worldview. Even in the fundamentalist evangelical movement in the 1920s and following, Christians were opposed to what was called religious liberalism, which is tied at the hip with political liberalism. And although Galatians 5.1 tells us to stand fast in the liberty in which Christ has set us free, the ungodly have stolen this term liberty and redefined it. And so now many conservatives are calling themselves classic liberals. Now, my guess is that they're doing this to ingratiate themselves with older Democrats, a way to explain to them that the Democratic Party is not the Democratic Party of your father. It's no longer liberalism. It's leftism. It's now a hatred toward Americanism. The only hesitation I have in all this is that classic liberalism still had within it the roots of modern liberalism and leftism. It was still based upon human reason rather than God's revelation, even though early liberals out of tradition still held to much of the law of God. The seeds of modern liberalism were sown by classic liberalism. So I prefer to call myself a child of the Christian Reformation, the biblical view of government, rather than calling myself a classic liberal. So just be aware of the terminology. 
Point number two. Another point that Os Guinness makes throughout this book is the opposing definitions of freedom. One, the 1776 definition of freedom expressed in the founding of the United States, uh, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and the other definition of freedom, the 1789 uh, definition expressed in the French Revolution and in the French Manifesto entitled The Declaration of the Rights of Man. Uh, these two definitions of freedom are being played out in society today. The American version emphasized freedom from unjust government. Uh, the French version emphasized freedom from tradition and religion. Uh, Notre Dame in France was renamed the Temple of Reason. And you know how this turned out. In France, there was the reign of terror. Chaos, lawlessness, and eventually France needed a dictator, Napoleon, to put everything back together. Uh, lawless freedom always ends in less freedom. In the words of one British political philosopher, I've long been convinced that institutions purely democratic, in other words, governments that operate on the will of man rather than the law of God, must sooner or later destroy liberty or civilization or both. Carl Jasper, in the name of liberty, the road into slavery is trod. G.K. Chesterton said it this way, if there's one fact we really can prove from history uh, that we really do know, it is that despotism can be a development, often a late development, and very often indeed the end of societies that have been highly democratic. Unlimited freedom will always end in a need for a despot. I believe this is what's going to happen to the Western world. Freedom without the law of God will result in the nations going after a despotic, antichrist-like figure, a government and a leader that is the beast. Revelation 13, 4, who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him. Without God's truth, leftism, liberalism is all about power. Micah chapter 2, verse 1 might makes right. However, is the definition of liberty in the French Declaration of the Rights of Man much different than the U.S. Bill of Rights? I don't have time to go into this in detail, but both documents are based upon this foundation of natural rights. The French even asked Thomas Jefferson to consult on their manifesto. And both documents are very ambiguous concerning where laws come from. Neither document mentions God. The real difference between the two documents is the people who applied them. The Americans applied liberty through a Christian understanding. They took for granted that the law of God superseded First Amendment rights. The French applied liberty through the lens of freedom from God, morality, and religion. Our Bill of Rights in the hand of ungodly men is ambiguous enough to do the same damage as the French Declaration of the Rights of Man. And that's why today the ungodly are finding in our Constitution the right to abortion, the right to homosexual marriage, both the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of the Rights of Men do not define liberty as under the law of God. So I would say Os Guinness's distinction that the battle today is between the definition of liberty in the Bill of Rights versus the Declaration of the Rights of Man as an error. The battle today is between the biblical covenant reformed view of government, government under God as taught in early America, versus the rationalistic man is autonomous from God uh, found in both of these political documents. I hope you get all this. In simple terms, follow God's word, not the reasonings of men in determining government policy and the definition of liberty. Point number three, I see Oz Guinness as arguing in the wrong ballpark. He's seeing the whole issue through the wrong framework, kind of like trying to play baseball in a football field. Every chapter tries to define freedom as including responsibility. In his chapter entitled, What Do You Mean by Freedom?, I came away with less of an understanding of freedom than I had before. 
Here are his points. Number one, freedom is a matter of the human will. Number two, freedom entails the idea of commitment making and keeping a promise. Number three, freedom includes the notion of human responsibility. Number four, freedom is a matter of power. Number five, freedom is not only a matter of choice, but of having genuine options from which to choose. Six, freedom itself is not an end, but a means to a goal. And number seven, freedom has a social and collective dimension. Well, all this is very philosophical, but a way to disciple people is to skip this whole attempt of trying to define freedom philosophically and just point out to people, Romans chapter 13, verse 4, which states that freedom is never absolute, uh, that God doesn't sanction the freedom to do evil. Romans 13, 4, for it, the state, is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Plain and simple. So end all this talk about seeing everything through the lens of freedom and get back to the word of God and what God demands of people and governments. That's the answer. The Bible doesn't address public policy in terms of freedom. Now, Oz Guinness states in his book that we need to have a nationwide discussion on freedom, quote, a debate on the important differences between views of freedom to address which points of freedom need to be restored. Well, I really don't think a debate on freedom is the answer. Thus saith the Lord is the answer. Return to natural law is the answer. See, the problem with philosophers, even many Christian philosophers, is that they neglect divine revelation and they want to come to values on the basis of human reasoning alone. And therefore, they inevitably deviate away from biblical truth and away from the biblical emphasis. John Calvin, in his Institutes, wrote the following. Profane men think that religion rests only on opinion. And therefore, that they may not believe foolishly or on slight grounds, desire and insist to have it proved by reason. We have a better support than man's judgment. We have the word of God. Well, the bottom line is 1 Corinthians 1.20. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And 1 Corinthians 1.25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Point number four. Os Guinness points out the difference between negative freedom and positive freedom. This is something you'll hear about, something you should understand. In 1776, the American Revolution emphasized positive freedom. And in 1789, the French Revolution emphasized negative freedom. Negative freedom is the freedom from law, freedom from the control of others. In the Exodus, the Israelites broke free from the control of Pharaoh. By itself, negative freedom will lead only to more licentiousness. Positive freedom is the freedom to do something good. In the Exodus, the Israelites were now free to go worship God in the wilderness. So negative freedom is simply a desire to be free from restraint. Positive freedom is wanting to be free to pursue the good. The pilgrims came to America to be free to worship God. The French revolutionaries wanted to be free from government. Negative freedom focuses on your desire for power. Positive freedom focuses on a desire for truth. And notice that most people get on board when you start talking about negative freedom, but positive freedom is not so popular. And negative freedom is dangerous if it is not combined with positive freedom. As in the case of the Israelites, if they wanted freedom from Pharaoh, but not for the purpose of going to worship God, it would have only resulted in more evil. Point number five. Regardless of the weaknesses of some of Oz Guinness's arguments, he's at least right in explaining that the left in America is wrongly defining this original concept of American freedom. The left is depicting the original restraints on freedom in America as racist, sexist, imperialist, militaristic, and genocidal. And that the original religious constraints on freedom 
were actually sources of repression. That homosexuals couldn't marry, that people couldn't have abortions, uh, that adultery was illegal. And so now for Americans to be free, they believe they must push for unlimited moral freedoms. And to have freedom economically, Americans now believe that we have to have government-controlled socialism, the government redistributing wealth. And the irony here is that the left believes that freedom is having the state take individual liberties away from the people so that the people can be free from Christian opinions, free from economic accountability, free from personal accountability. What's actually happening is that there's an ever-growing number of American citizens who, in their rebellion to God, want freedom from, from morality and freedom from economic responsibility, which is the wrong kind of freedom. And this is why they will vote for sexual liberty, but not for economic liberty, because they want to be able to engage in sexual immorality, but also get a check from the government. So the left is actually fighting for freedom from freedom, which is a strange paradox. They actually want to be slaves to their lusts, slaves to their marijuana, slaves to the state, so they can be relieved of personal responsibility. And boy, this sounds so much like the false teachers mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. Promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. So let me conclude with the following important point. In any discussion or definition of freedom, political freedom cannot be the primary goal for the individual. There must first be spiritual freedom because every man is in bondage to sin and death. Every man is a slave of sin. In Jesus' day, the political zealots were actively seeking f political freedom from Rome as if that was the major problem, when they should have first been seeking freedom from personal sin. Uh, this was what Jesus pointed out in the temple. John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus said, You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Jesus wasn't emphasizing political freedom, but freedom from the presence and the penalty of sin. Now, this is kind of a bizarre response on the part of the Jewish leadership that they had never been enslaved to anyone because, as it was right then, they were being occupied by the Roman Empire, and before that, the Greek Empire, and before that, the Persian Empire, and before that, the Babylonian Empire. Yet they say, we have never been enslaved to anyone. Probably they were claiming that despite these empires, they considered themselves free. But Jesus turns the table on them and explains that they were never morally free. Everyone is a slave to sin. Uh, the apostle Paul brought out the same concept in 1 Corinthians 7. The Corinthians were concerned about political freedom and slavery. And Paul insists that those things are secondary. 1 Corinthians 7, 22, because if you're a Christian, you are free in the Lord. You are actually more free than your master, even if you're a slave. Because spiritual freedom is way more important than political freedom. All the kings and the governments of this world cannot make you do evil if you're a Christian, and they cannot thwart your future life with God. So Augustine wrote to the Christians in the 5th century, Thus a good man, though a slave, is free. But a wicked man, though a king, is a slave. For he serves not one man alone, but what is worse, as many masters as he has vices. So you're not free unless you're under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Do you really live in the land of the free and the home of the brave? 
Well, if you haven't made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you don't live there. You live in the land of sin and death. So the book is called The Last Call for Liberty by Oz Guinness. Thank you for taking the time to make God and country a part of your discipleship in the Word. Contact information is on the closing slide. May God richly bless you as you continue to live in the Word of God. Because Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine. God bless. Oh,